So welcome. Of course, this is uh, Bill Code and Christina, Christina Mitz. Um, Christina and I worked together a couple of years now. She's quite an expert on the microbiome, which has been a great asset for us. And today we're going to talk more about the microbiome. We're going to talk about the pulse oximeter. I promised that. So we brought one with us. We've each tested ourselves now so we can give you a good story on that because I'm, of course, a little older than Christina. And uh, it all makes a difference. But the wonderful piece about the pulse oximeter is that it will give you a great baseline at home. And when you're starting to slip, it'll show up there easily and well. In fact, it's probably one of the number one things used in hospital these days, especially now, because often you can make a big difference to yourself with the pulse oximeter. So we've got one that's here it is example. Someone asked, and a good question, are there particular brands? There's probably a hundred or a thousand brands out now because these started to happen in 19, about 1983. Okay. It was an absolute game changer in anesthesiology. That's when I started training was 1983. Prior to that, I had done some general practice anesthesia in a small town in Saskatchewan in the prairies of Canada. But uh, it made such a huge difference that our insurance premiums went from 10 to 12,000 a year down to 1,000, closer to what it would be for a family doctor or a general practitioner. Um, and they've become a very much a routine. In fact, they've become such a routine, I would like to suggest they've even sometimes been almost abused because they, in hospital, if you've got it on, maybe you've had a heart attack or a stroke or some other event, they are in such a conscientious concept of tr not needing it if you're 92 or more. So you can't maybe see mine. Yeah, maybe you can. Okay. So I'm about 97, 98. My pulse is up a little. It's about 84 right now. That's because I'm naturally anxious being online acutely. Uh, and you did yours before. Mm, let's do it again. And so... You know, mine is probably 97, 98 at the minute. I can take it to 100 if I put on nasal prongs of oxygen with two or three liters per minute, and it makes a profound difference. Um, it's stabilizing on yours. Your pulse is, well, 54. That's impressive. And, you know, I would expect it will read it read earlier 99, right? It did, yeah. Yeah. And so Christina's younger than I am. There's no question, like many functions in the body, by the time we hit 40, we slip typically about 1% per year. That doesn't mean you're down to 60% by the time you're 80, but it's 1% per year. So it's gradually reducing. But you get to change that. And all the pieces that we talk about for helping you cope and survive and do well in the presence of COVID-19 all tie into that optimizing your aging factor. And if you look at centenarians, mm -hmm. they have a particular microbiome. Typically, they typically have what a lot of diversity, they have greater diversity. So there has been one study done looking at, at the gut microbiomes of centenarians living up to 105, which is impressive. And they tend to have a microbiome characterized by greater diversity, more butyrate producing microbes. So butyrate being one of your short chain fatty acids that's produced by the microbes. And they have less uh, proteobacteria or less pathogenic microbes. Sure. And so it's all about balance or, you know, as Andre Beauchamp said at the time of Pasteur, it's about the terrain. And the terrain I would suggest to you Mean that you've got many different microbes uh, and maybe in smaller amounts. So in a previous discussion, we kind of we kind of hit on Prevotella, right? Mm -hmm. And Prevotella can be a, a very favorable entity. We're going to talk a little bit about lung microbiome because the lung has its own microbiome. Up until a few years ago, we thought the lung in normal situations was sterile. Not true. Not true at all. So I think in a good scenario, it has multiple species of Prevotella, mm -hmm. right? Definitely. Because that's immunomodulatory, meaning it calms or optimizes your immune system. So it reduces your likelihood of cytokine storm. Remember, that's the 
pro, pro, pro inflammatory. And when it changes, when it gets to a problem of hypoxia, which can creep on because of the virus, and we'll talk about a couple of reasons for that today, um, then all of a sudden it tends to have different bacteria. And it has the ones that we might think of in pneumonia. And those would be, of course, strep pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza pneumonia, even occasionally Klebsiella, I think. And the other one that we talk about is gamma. Yeah, it was the gamma proteobacteria, right. which those all kind of fall under. And yeah. I think the only one we're missing is the enterobacter uh, or the enterobacteria. Sting. Sure. Yeah. So the key thing about it is, is why they occur. So the infection can occur in COVID-19 We've talked a little bit about the so-called co-infection, and this is primarily in the gut, I would suggest. If you have a dominant one particular strain in the gut, A and then four digits, okay? That's a particular strain of bacteria, which is a great team up, unfortunately, with COVID-19. And that's the presence that people do the worst with, okay? so. Prevotella is dominant, as we talked about, and one of the reasons it enhances if you're eating a lot of grains in your diet. And probably woe is you if you're only eating one grain, because that lets you have only a focused, maybe one or two small numbers of Prevotella, which are in a dominant portion, and you're not getting the wide group of Prevotella. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So when we see gut microbiomes dominated by Prevotella, it does tend to be in societies that eat a lot more starches, specifically ones that come from grains. So uh, the most relevant study to this is uh, there was this study done looking at or comparing the microbiomes of people in Burkina Faso, so Africa, compared to those with um, the gut microbiomes in Italy and kind of more of like an Americanized diet in Italy. And the African guts did have significantly more Privatella and their diet was made up of 50% or more of millet and corn. Mm -hmm. And then the rest was kind of uh, pretty limited vegetables, a couple legumes and a bit of butter. Yeah, and so, and that was in children. Yeah, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really useful study. And it was kind of in the early days um, when we started looking at microbiome, because if we could, we would the one of the closest places we could get to it would be in those earlier cultures or cultures that hadn't changed much to the North American diet. And then, of course, Dr. Weston Price from the, you know, of dental fame went around to all the cultures in the world that he could to find the ones that were still doing the basic food groups. And there was a huge spectrum, but they tended to be very healthy mm -hmm. and doing really well. A lot of them had a huge amount of exercise, which is also useful. We maybe haven't said it enough, but regular exercise is a great diversity enhancement and well-being of your microbiome. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. And I would say for those who are watching who are chronically ill uh, with something like MS or otherwise, low to moderate exercise is going to be more helpful for your microbiome. So something that you can do habitually. Yeah. So and, you know, a couple of clues to that, because I, I spent a major chapter on exercise in my book, um, is that a vibration machine may do some of those components. It is a one way to get exercise if you're quite limited in what you can do. I first saw this in South Africa. I was visiting a woman trying to help her with her MS in Durban, South Africa. This is probably 10, 15 years ago. And she would quite hesitatingly walk in to see her kinesiologist who had a, a vibration machine made in, in the Netherlands. And she would walk out quite normally you know, after 20 minutes on that, because it fires the muscles and it fires three sets of muscles. It fast, it fires the slow fibers, which is what you and I would use walking. It fires the fast fibers, which is what we would use in a, you know, a, a running to some degree or jogging. And it fires the super fast fibers, which is what we would use if there was a lion upon us or a tiger and we 
big adrenaline surge, pull all those muscles in. Those are the ones that let you take your hand off a super hot stove instantly, the super fast fibers, but all of those will fire, fire. So if you're unfortunate enough, you're maybe primarily bound to a chair, never underestimate the value of using your arms, okay? Huge exercise with the arms. And if you wanna stress someone um, a fair amount and get their heart rate up, using their arms is a big way to do it because we've got small muscles in the arms, modest blood supply because the vessels aren't that huge. Uh, and whereas on legs, we've got big muscles. Mm -hmm. So the same repetitive motions do more with bringing up the heart rate and the exercise motion with the arms. And many people can do that even if they're somewhat chair bound or paraplegic or whatever the term might be. Exactly. I can think of so many good examples. Um, so in Kundalini yoga, they do exercises where you literally just, you sit in your chair and you shake your arms back and forth for five to seven minutes. And then you could also use something like resistant band, resistance bands and just kind of pull them or lift them up um, as they were hooked to your chair. And that would be pretty good exercise for your upper body. So just because we're talking about a little bit about uh, MS at the moment, one of the questions that people have asked, and it, it's a good one, is, is there a possibility that reactivation of one's MS symptoms could be indicative of the virus? Well, the answer is pro possibly yes. And part of that is because we know if we get a fever, and the virus may well give us a fever, and we'll say maybe why it might not, it may give us a fever, and of course, most of us get our MS symptoms aggravated. So fatigue, muscle cramps, spasm, all of those issues often worsen with a fever. So that's why I want people to have a thermometer at home, check that temperature. If it's over 38.5, yes, you've probably got the virus, and that's probably aggravating your MS symptoms. Any major stressor to the body will tend to flare the MS symptoms. Because let's look back again for what I talk about in the new MS, meaning microvascular syndrome. And that is an area of the brain, and it's always the area that aggravated and has trouble with MS, is relatively short of oxygen. So that area that's short of oxygen doesn't function as well. Without the oxygen, the neurons in that region can't make enough energy. To make energy, you need the oxygen plus the fuel inside those cells. And if that isn't present, you get symptoms because the neurons go into idling mode or asleep. They're often still viable if you can wake them up again. And that's why my treatment for that is more oxygen. In a perfect world, you might do hyperbaric. Uh, we've talked a bit about that. We'll talk a bit about it again, but in that case, once a week, that hyperbaric often helps those neurons stay the same for 10, 20, and even 30 years. This is studies done in the UK, which has the best available hyperbaric oxygen treatment on the planet because of the efforts of Dr. Philip James, Professor James in Dundee, Scotland, with his book, Oxygen in the Brain, where he talked about that. And he's still one of my favorite mentors by far. So the other part that it gives you a clue in is if you're lucky enough to have your pulse oximeter and almost any brand is going to be reasonable. I know my sister purchased one online for $50. That's Canadian. So that's pretty reasonable. The, if you spend a fraction more, maybe up to 80 or a hundred, there may be a little bit more tolerant of motion and movement. But if you put them on a warm finger, a cold finger will tend not to work because they of course, interpret the pulse. They use the pulse wave and they make a decision based on that for your heart rate, of course, but they also make a decision based on the oxygen hemoglobin. So that's the amount of hemoglobin that's saturated. And I think that's worth a bit of a comment now because um, Luke had sent me a, a pretty entertaining and a little bit flamboyant um, post from a, one of his contacts. And it talked about what is happening with the virus? And so I think this is still in the early stages. The paper that we found was put together 
in computer science by quite a sophisticated informatics lab in China. So I'm not a wizard on these things, but the premise I can tell you, it may have some place in the virus attacking us because the suggestion in that paper, and this far it's only a suggestion, but it may be of interest and our clinical people in the ICU will be able to watch these parameters. So the suggestion was that the virus is able to attack the porphyrin, which is the hemoglobin heme molecule inside the hemoglobin, okay? So it's the heme molecule inside the hemoglobin that uses iron, and the iron can be in Fe2 or Fe3, and as it switches back and forth, it can pick up oxygen as you breathe it in, in the respiratory molecule going through the, through the uh, membrane, carry it to the body and drop the oxygen off and in a perfect world, pick up carbon dioxide, bring it back and exchange it again for a new one. When the hemoglobin or the heme is attached or irritated or works with the molecule, it tends to injure that heme molecule and it's unable to drop off CO2 and it's unable to pick up oxygen. Consequently, the molecule breaks down and even there's some free iron reduced or produced and residual to the lungs. Many of you may or may not know, but iron outside the blood vessels is extremely irritating to the body. It's a very major pro-oxidant. An example would be you injure your knee and you get a bleed into the knee it's gonna do a lot more injury or damage. The same with a bleed in the head, which happens with traumatic brain injury or a concussion. The blood outside the blood vessels becomes iron as it breaks down and it creates a lot of injury. So it's an interesting premise. And part of the premise is those people, the body tries to make new hemoglobin, okay? And so they tend to have a fairly high hemoglobin but they don't have very much oxygen carrying capacity and their pulse oximeter will start to drop, okay? And if it becomes really aggravated, it may be part of the feature of that iron in the lungs, which gives you the bilateral pneumonia because almost all the people that do badly and pass away have bilateral pneumonia and that's not that common. I mean, we see it occasionally, but it's usually one-sided or maybe a lobe in the other lung. So, when it's bilateral pneumonia and that so-called ground glass appearance on an X-ray, chest X-ray, that bodes poorly for that individual. They're probably gonna end up on a ventilator and all those consequent things. Mm -hmm. But the way to prevent it is boosting the oxygen, getting that pulse oximeter back up closer to normal. So most of us, almost all of us, if we get under 90, that not, doesn't sound too bad, 90%, right? Mm -hmm. But what does it mean? If you look at the difference between 99 and 92, at 99, you've got maybe 120 millimeters of mercury circulating in the body and arriving, hopefully, in the brain and where it's needed. But if you're down at 92, you're down closer to 60 millimeters of mercury. So these are numbers that you would find on your blood gases, right? And that's a big change because when you get to the end stage, because the oxygen always has to leave the hemoglobin to get to the cells, of course, it leaves the hemoglobin. So therefore leaves the red blood cell, diffuses, which is only on a pressure gradient, downhill through the liquid of the blood, the plasma, through the lining, or the endothelial lining the blood vessel, and then through the extracellular fluid to the cell. So if you're at 120 going downhill there, it's a much better deal than being only at 60. And this is why, you know, for example, it's a big deal to cope with Mount Everest without oxygen supplementation. In fact, some people just can't do it. And you can't always predict. Young and old people will get altitude sickness because these all tie in. And that's why I hope many of you have heard the concept. If you're living at altitude, you're gonna be a little bit more at risk. Yeah. So we can't necessarily move, but we can consider. 
So we've talked a bit about the oxygen and, and the pulse oximeter. So let's go a little bit back to the to the microbiome and how we can again optimize that. Mm -hmm. Well, I like the connection between the oxygen and, and the lungs, because one of the things that happens when the lung microbiome shifts is that the lungs start to become more anaerobic. So when we have this inflammation response occurring, um, you have an increase of circulation, an increase of nutrient delivery to the area, which feeds more microbes. So you start to see more microbes proliferating in the lungs that aren't usually there. The lungs usually have an innate capacity to keep those microbes away. They produce a lipid rich surfactant, which is bactericidal. So it keeps the microbes away most of the time. But when you have that, in that increase in inflammation, the increase in delivery of nutrients, you start to see more microbes growing in the lungs. And then they start creating pockets of um, uh, oxygen de deprived pockets within the lungs. And then it kind of sets off a cycle, a snowball effect where it just continues on from there. And you start to see more and more microbes. So let's do a crawler. We've got a couple of questions here. And, and uh, the one is about MS and the possibility that either vitamin B, which I've, you know, enthused about vitamin D and of course, vitamin C for other different reasons. And the person's asking, they're getting more leg cramps. Leg cramps in MS are often hugely benefited by more magnesium. And now is not a good time to be short on magnesium. If you're not getting a ton of green leafy vegetables, you would could probably, and I recommend all my MS clients, do at least 500 milligrams of magnesium per day, often best in the evening because it tends to help sleep. Yeah, and actually what I'm getting from this question as well, she's saying she's getting the cramps and spasms when she takes vitamin B or vitamin D. And so vitamin D can throw off your magnesium store. So you have to make sure you're taking enough magnesium to balance that out uh, when you're taking the vitamin D. The same thing, vitamin yeah. D, mag magnesium, calcium, and vitamin K all work together. Yeah. The four of them, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, well stated. So if you have, for reasons that I've recommended boosted your D, you may need to bring your magnesium up. And magnesium is e almost as equally important as adding in zinc and then that 100 micrograms of selenium, because each of those are gonna make a difference. So another individual has asked, any advice for remembering to eat? I'm pretty sure my metabolism is slowed down right now and I often forget to eat. Well, my suggestion is forgetting to eat for some 13 hours a day so some degree of fasting it's usually through the night of course is very beneficial because it helps reset the sugar molecules within the body in the insulin production so that's quite an asset so the good part about that is you can you take advantage of that and do it then during the day whichever you need to, to try and, you know, take in the calories. If we're relatively sedentary, because we're stuck in our apartment or our household area and we can't get outside and we can't exercise, you know, reduced eating is probably useful. The key thing about it though is, are you getting enough? And this would be the people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or lung disease problems, and that they're starting to waste away because they don't have enough calories. Mm -hmm. So those people need to really conscientiously eat. And anybody that's on reduced amounts of eating, I particularly would like them, and this especially applies to the lung problem people, boost your whey protein. So I've been on the Point of Return website. They make a, a whey protein called Support. That's a good one. Brad King's out of Vancouver is a good one. There's a very good quality you want to undenatured whey protein. I traveled for a number of years from Unitech Research. They provide one out of Montreal, but there's many, many of them. You can't get the economy version that the guys in the gym use because usually that's been heated so high that it doesn't retain that cysteine molecule, which is a little double bonded amino acid, sulfur containing, which can really help the body build more glutathione. Glutathione is the body's master antioxidants. Um, 
It's the one we can make best in the body because it's not easy to absorb it. And it is a critically important in optimal lung function. And it's really important also in liver function and even kidney function. And one of the people at risk, as we've talked about, is the people with liver troubles. Okay, whether that's cirrhosis or that's fatty liver or a whole host of things. So I guess when you, at the end of the day, if you look back, this is our chance to reset ourselves. Worry about the COVID-19 virus is a wake up call for us. Mm -hmm, it really is. We've got to get back, you know, to the basics, optimizing our own personal health, because that's the key to the whole deal. Anything you do to adjust, to minimize your risk with the virus is going to help you individually long term in a huge way. Well, we can come back to that question about the uh, remembering to eat. So a really simple way to do this would be to uh, take some elastic bands, say three. So you have one elastic band per meal that you want to remember to eat. And then every time you look at your wrist, you say, oh, well, I've still got three elastic bands on here. I need to eat my first meal of the day. Once, once you've eaten, take off that elastic band. And then a couple hours later, look back at your wrist and hopefully you see there's still two elastic bands there. So you want to eat again. Um, and I would say if you are going to do calorie restriction or intermittent fasting or anything like that, try to um, restrict your window of eating during daylight hours. Don't leave your window of eating all the way to the end of the day. So um, if you're going to do intermittent fasting, eat, try to make your window of eating, say, from like 11 to 5 or something along those lines. You'll find that you, you sleep a lot better. And that's also actually helpful for your microbiome as well. Uh, so your microbiome does follow cues that are given by your circadian rhythm, which is influenced by daylight hours. And so, and a piece of that is we have, we'll be spending some time on SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. But one of the important principles there is not to snack for some three to four hours. Because mm -hmm. if you go that three to four hours with really nothing but water or maybe a cup of tea, then you enable the digestive juices and the digestive mobility through the gut to be more normalized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the short story is we used to talk about grazing. I've got old habits and they die hard, but I try to reduce my grazing so I can be three or four hours without food to optimize that because I've gone through a diagnosis of SIBO and so we're going to talk about that at another point. One other question we've had is about oil pulling. So this was well covered by the, the uh, biologic dentist from New York, Dr. Curatola, because if you're going to do oil pulling, fine, but I wouldn't do it more than a couple of weeks and then done. If you do it long term, you're going to create some other problems which you're not going to be happy about. So oil pilling can be used to wild kind of reset things after two weeks. That's it. And another question was about toothpaste. Most of the time now I use no toothpaste. I've been through the whole cycle. Like many of you have, I used to use a years ago, a fluoride toothpaste. I thought this total thing by Colgate was just awesome. Total mean that it killed every single bacteria in my mouth. And that is not good. And that's why I tend to lean towards no toothpaste, a whisper of salt, a whisper of bicarb. What are your favorite? Mm -hmm. uh, well, for toothpaste, if I'm going to use toothpaste, I like the Designs for Health Periobiotic. It does contain certain probiotic strains that are shown to shift the oral microbiome for the better. So if you know that microbiome of the mouth is imbalanced, you can use that. Um, what's also recommended, recommended by Stephen Lin, who he's the functional dentist, uh, he recommends something that contains xylitol, which can break up the biofilms created by those pathogenic microbes that are taking over uh, in the mouth if you do have an infection. And this gets to be a challenge because Curatola, like most, most dentists are very keen on xylitol. He's not so keen on it either. The one toothpaste he make, creates and makes, and it has those advantages probiotic wise, is Revitin. So, could you spell the one that you mentioned? Um, I have it here. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. So, look, look it up because until you folks 
sometimes hearing it isn't enough to look it up. It's P E R I O B I O T I C toothpaste. And that's by Designs for Health. Periobiotic. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes a lot of sense when we hear about it. You can also use a green tea mouthwash. So you could mm -hmm. mix some green tea or matcha with uh, xylitol and say baking soda and a couple other ingredients. And that would be a good, um, good thing to swish with. So I'm just going to cover a couple things because um, Christine has written quite a good article talking about that, and we'll be posting that on my website, drbillcode.com, D-R-B-I-L-L-C-O-D-E.com, because it's, it's a bit tricky to cover all these. But I'm going to let you look at the um, similarities between a, two or three things. One is the characteristics of early frailty in the microbiota, okay? So that's reduced diversity, less butyrate, that's that short chain fatty acid, more proteobacteria and pathogens, an increase in periodontal or mouth bacteria, problem ones, and a chronic low grade inflammation. When you get to the characteristics of type two microbiome, it's almost the same. Type okay. two diabetes, that is. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, type two diabetes mellitus, it's almost the same list. There's a little bit more of bacteroidetes, there's greater oxidative stress, and less diversity. You get down to cardiovascular disease microbiome, much of the same. Again, more mouth organisms that are unhealthy, low butyrate producers. So it's a pretty common theme across the board. Each of those people will do some benefit by shifting their diet. And they can do it in as short as a week or two to start to make an improvement. So most of us aren't going out to the Golden Arches and having burgers and all these other sorts of things. But I hope that you're adapting some of the things. I'm a huge fan of pizza. And, and uh, so Cindy, one of our colleagues, right, she's put together a wonderful quinoa recipe. So we'll have that on the website as well. It's a quinoa pizza dough. So that's great because you can have your pizza and eat it too yeah awesome yeah and if it wasn't clear so those three groups the cardiovascular disease the type 2 diabetes and the aging uh, so those groups are all um, at higher risk for actually being impacted by the coronavirus and we could find much of the same story if we looked at the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or people with recurrent troubles with their asthma um, asthma of course is a risk for the lungs the asthma is a nice lead in for us because if the virus starts to affect us, it tends to start in the upper respiratory areas, the sinuses and the throat. But in three to four days, it migrates down into the lungs. And there it changes things as it goes along. It seems to injure the cells that make the cilia. These are little brush border that move things up out of the lungs. It moves problems of particulate matter or any of these other features. Unfortunately, those cilia disappear with cigarette smoking, okay? So that's why quitting smoking is so critical, but it's also why it takes you three to six months to get things cleared up. People say, well, I cough worse when I smoke. Some of that's true because the irritation of cough, but the body has to re-clean and rebuild that layered surface to a single layer because in smoking, it becomes a multiple layer, almost like your skin. So there's multiple cells because it's keratified or hardened or firmed up just so it can tolerate the cigarette smoke, which is a very negative fashion. So the other piece that's just come out this week, I, I was just reading about it, is the influence of air pollution. And of course, that's been one of the suggestions, but now it's been a, in a published paper folks in a tough air polluted area are gonna be at more at risk of lung disease and severity of COVID-19. That apparently is a problem, I guess, Northern Italy in and around the impact of the major problem is one of the more polluted places in Europe. It's maybe one of the risk factors, unfortunately, for New York, Los Angeles. I worry a bit about in Toronto, frankly. As we look at Canada currently, 
British Columbia has been doing a little bit better than we would expect just with regard to the rest of Canadians. And I wonder if that might be, we have our lucky, we've got some of the cleanest mm -hmm. air and the cleanest water in the country. I read another paper by Dr. Semeff from MIT, and she's suggesting part of the influence of these tough areas might be as simple as the biodiesel use heavily in those airports around the air, those particular areas, because many people have adapted biodiesel in. The downside of biodiesel, often it is made by the use of glyphosate in the genetically modified either soybean, whether it comes from Argentina or wherever, or corn. So glyphosate, of course, has its own set of problems, but it also is really hard on the body and the ability to toxins. So that might be filtering in another one. That might explain part of the issue, even in Seattle. I think so, definitely. At least with the clients we see at our clinic, those who come from the States tend to have uh, elevated levels of glyphosate. And we, even though it's still present here in Canada, we're definitely doing a fair bit better. We are a fair bit better. Um, I had a young child of six, though, that was up to 95th percentile who lives in the prairies because um, we're living in a, well, you call it la la land out here, but right. people are pretty anxious and, you know, involved in looking after their health out here. It's less so in the Midwest because people are pretty wrapped up doing other things, but the water in most of North America is contaminated because glyphosate sprayed it on the ground. It injures the microbiome of the soil, which is a very important deal. It's not accidental that we grow things organically on our little farm here. And it goes into the runoff in the water. So you're drinking it. So if you really want to change that, spend two or $300, buy a reverse osmosis unit, put it under your sink for your drinking water. And it's going to make a difference over time. And you could hopefully go, when I had mine measured, I was happy I was down at the, about the five percentile. But when I see them in the 70s and 90s, and one of my friends in the Midwest, he was quite surprised. He was up there in that 70 range. So that's just from sometimes the water, but it's our foods too. In Canada, the United States, nearly 90% of our wheat is harvested with, with uh, Roundup as a desiccant. And the same is used frequently in commercial potatoes, sweet potatoes, and certainly beet sugar and, and cane sugar. Mm -hmm. So all of those are a relevant risk. So if you're going to eat those foods, know who grew it, how they did it, or eat organic. Because organic will not have any glyphosate on it. It may have some from the spray or the water in the system, but it'll have much, much less. Mm -hmm. I think definitely if you're shopping at the grocery store, you're going to want to look for that certified organic label. But if you're able to go to the farmer's market or if you have farm connections, you can ask the farmers directly what types yeah. of farming methods they're using. So they might be growing things without chemicals entirely, but they might not be paying for that organic label. And you can find that out and you might end up paying a little less uh, because they've paid less not to have the cert certificate. Sure, it takes, it, it's a lot of effort and so on to maintain the organic status. And rightly it should, because it's, you know, it's monitoring it and the whole deal. It was very interesting when I was in 2006 to 2008, I took my integrative medicine training and we would with Andrew Weil down in Arizona and we would meet for a week, once a year for three years with our classmates. And there was about 80 in my class and some of them were from the Midwest. And you know, people in the Midwest, because I'm originally from the Midwest too, that's okay. Um, but it was interesting, many of the farmers that farmed heavy duty corn or heavy duty soybean, they had a five acre plot where they did their own growing of vegetables. And then they didn't eat that stuff. Smart, you know, at least look after yourself and your family. And so that's what I'm wanting you to do is get more self-sufficient. Seed sales have really gone up. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yep. People can turn their lawn or their porch or whatever into growing some food. A, it's good for you. B, it's good for you also for your microbiome because as you get that soil microbiota, the same things that benefit the soil benefit our own. Maybe this isn't too surprising. I mean, we've grown up with the millennia of that 
healthy bacteria. And it's only in the last 50 years, well, maybe 70 years now, that we really kind of polluted it. But we need to move back, move back to having it healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy food. Mm -hmm. It all fits together. Yeah, it's also good for the environment as well. So the healthier our soil is, the more carbon capture that occurs. See, have we got any questions that have come up today we want to follow? If you guys have any questions, now is the time to, Now's the time enter to ask them. them in. I never thought to mention it, but if you can, link in other people in your contact list if you're favorable with doing that. It does help us get the word out. It's it's quite exciting because we, you know, we've got four or five hundred people on already today, and often when we go back the next morning, we've had a thousand views, because well, a it's a captive audience. People are stuck at home. I get that. It's okay, but that's part of the reason we're doing this. We have time and energy to do it because we can't run the regular work processes that we can, and again, is you know, knowledge is power. The more you can use your own time, effort, and wisdom, because we're trying to guide you through that. I mean, that's why I wrote, you know, solving the brain puzzle for that simple reason to give you the tips of what to do. All right. Well, I do have one comment here from a, an MS patient. She tries very hard to eat grain free. When she's eating a cheat food, she really feels the side effects. She gets cramps and gut upset. Uh, any comments or suggestions? So yes, definitely all of the things that we've mentioned before, including in the last um, the last part of our video series to grow your microbiome. Uh, there are definitely going to be some populations who um, who might not be able to grow back their microbes. So, I mean, the first step for growing back your microbiome is to use fiber. And so we obviously we want to try this method first. So try taking different types of fiber for a couple months, whichever one serves you the best. There's a lot of different varieties of, um, fiber supplements that you, you can take. And that way you've isolated it down to one type of fiber, which can sometimes be easier on the system. So the easiest to tolerate fiber, the one that I usually use with people who are the most sensitive is the partially hydrolyzed guar gum. That one is usually tolerated quite well, and it helps to grow your butyrate producing microbes. And butyrate is gonna help coat the intestinal lining and it's gonna make things feel a lot better. But if you are in one of those groups who, after doing this for a couple months, you don't end up seeing the results, you might be one of those people whose microbiome is just completely wiped out. So maybe you did too many rounds of antibiotics, maybe you've had heavy metal toxicity or something else going on that's wiped out those bugs, and you're going to want to replenish that by doing something like the gut flora transplant or the microbiota transplants. So, and just to go back to the question, the problem with most of our inexpensive foods, and this is, I think especially applies to the, to the Americans, but it does to some degree in Canada too, there's a huge supplementation of income for the people that grow soy and corn. And that makes the byproducts of those that are used in the fast food industry relatively inexpensive. Downside is they're gonna all have major glyphosate in them. Glyphosate, the other old name for it was Roundup in days gone by, was Monsanto, now it's Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R. But that's so dominantly used in that growth process, it can flare us. The other thing that's in these inexpensive foods and what you don't want is hardly any processed, heavily processed foods, because there's often a lot of things in there. They don't even have to list on the label a number of the chemical antioxidants that they use because it tends to maintain theoretically freshness and so on. So the closer it can be to the natural whole food, the better by far, because it's got those nuances and it has the fibers in it. And the other thing, even as simple as the dyes in it, we sometimes often see this in children, children with pandas or pans, they're sensitive to many things. Children with autism can be sensitive to many things. And People with MS, I find, often can have major food sensitivities they didn't realize. One of my good friends, she had a problem with lettuce, and she didn't know until she did an IgG food sensitivity testing, in that case with Great Plains Labs, because there can be things awry. And I think this maybe 
takes us back to one point I don't think we've done enough here is that when we have a problem with our microbiome, it isn't healthy. All of a sudden now, the junction of where our gut joins to the bloodstream, the so-called uh, gut barrier junction, if it's unwell, then the tight junctions between the cells is opened up. That opening up of the tight junctions, that better, allows proteins to leak into the bloodstream. And this is an ongoing challenge for a couple of reasons. First of all, small pieces of food get in, the body does the correct thing, it attacks this foreign invader. All right, well and good, but now you are on the road, you may develop one of the some 400 autoimmune diseases, which are really your own body attacking a foreign protein, and now that protein seems to look a lot like the lining of your joints. Now you've got rheumatoid arthritis. So that's the other part. The other piece that we've talked a lot about, um, and we talk about it in, in my book, is LPS, lipopolysaccharide. So when bacteria die, because all things live and die over time, but when the gram-negative bacteria, a subset of bacteria in the gut, die, then little pieces pinch off. And these, if you have leaky gut, can get into the bloodstream. And those tiny pieces, which are recognized and measured in some labs, most of them not in Canada, unfortunately, as LPS or lipopolysaccharide. And that is known to be a huge inflammation creator throughout the body. And so it creates a problem with inflammation in the brain, that's never good for any of our neurodegenerative diseases, whether it's MS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or even post-stroke, or LPS to the lungs. Now you've got inflammation in the lungs. These are not good cascades to trigger because it's going to aggravate and may mount up in addition with, you know, the inflammation that's created by the flare of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. It's also a factor in cardiovascular disease and diabetes as well. So there's those COVID risk, risk factors again, coming back to the microbiome. Well, that's right. And I know one of the quotes in the book, I was happy it came out just before I published it, was in women. So nice, because we don't get as many studies in women as we should, but it showed arterial stiffening. If they had reduced uh, diversity in the microbiome, and probably part of it is that LPS that's leaking in to the bloodstream, okay? All of these things are reversible. We can heal that gut lining. And often the best way to do it is increase the diversity. In the short term, yeah, you can do it with probiotics, and we're really pushing bifidus this month, of mm -hmm. course, because we know that most North Americans are relatively low in the bifidus group. But we're also trying to take the prebiotics, the things in our food that will help boost the bifidus, and then again, the diversity. I had one of the questions was about lectins. So lectins is a tricky deal, okay? Lectins come along for a reason. The plant produces lectins usually to reduce the amount that animals eat it, okay? And digest it, and then they can't have its seed propagate, theoretically. So lectins are often a responsive part that we're sensitive to. Some people are exquisitely sensitive to almost all lectins, and they, they start to find, you know, what foods can I eat? I happily can tolerate more lectins now than I could, and part of that's because I had gut floral transplant, and it rebuilt things. I probably had a gluten sensitivity probably since I was a kid, and I suspect an undiagnosed celiac, but that means that my I have relatively poor absorption. But I can tolerate many more foods now. I talked about that IgG food sensitivity test earlier. I used to have about eight foods that I couldn't tolerate. And now it's down to one or two. I still avoid casein or dairy typically, and I avoid gluten. And most other things I can tolerate much better than I could. So now I can tolerate cashews before I couldn't. And, you know, the list goes on and on. 
Right. And I would say if you're having issues with lectins, you really want to ask yourself or look into why this is happening. And so if you're not breaking down lectins properly, well, are you lacking the microbes that break those things down? Are you lacking enzymes? So do you have pancreatic enzyme deficiency? Do you have sufficient bile production? Do you have sufficient uh, stomach acid production, all of these different upstream things that can lead to you not breaking those things down properly and then becoming a problem for your body. So, and you know, that's well stated because as we get older, we tend to have less enzyme production. As we get older, we tend to have less acid production. Although woe is you if you're on a protein pump inhibitor, because now you got zero acid production. So that doesn't bode well for your digestibility of foods. So a protein which might have had some digestion happening on it and maybe initiated by the acidity in the, in the stomach, it's not going to do as well because you don't have any acidity, you don't get that pre-digestion piece, you're going to have less digestive enzymes. So often you can help it in the short term with digestive enzymes. I mean, I learned 20 years ago, I was having a problem with chocolate, it gave me heartburn. No, well, that's never any fun because I love chocolate. Um, and all of a sudden, Denise had done enough reading to know that one of the triggers for heartburn was fat molecules, okay? So I started to take a lipase containing enzyme and I could eat chocolate again. And after I did the gut floral transplant, now I can eat chocolate with impunity, I don't get heartburn. A lot of us have heartburn for a specific reason because we know that the lipid molecules can reduce the patency or closing of the esophageal stomach valve okay so if it's open then you get a splash of acid going up you experience it as heartburn well instead of putting a suture around and closing it off which some people would talk about doing if you don't want to go there solve the problem you don't maybe want to avoid fats because there is value in eating fats certainly but if you take a digestive enzyme you'll tolerate it I've got another friend and colleague, and she can't take the fish oils unless she takes an enzyme with them. Mm. But if she takes an enzyme, she's golden. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and in the same way that Bill had uh, his intolerances to uh, gluten, I had I was also sensitive to lectins at one point as well, and that was due to having SIBO. And again, we will cover that in more detail later on. Yeah. So we had one other question from Wendy with regard to MS and Raynaud's. Well, Raynaud's, of course, is the general term. Your fingers get all white or all blue and purple, quite painful. And it is literally a vasculitis, meaning inflammation of the vessels and they're shutting down and they turn purple and white because the blood flow isn't going through. Remember, flow through a tube is the fourth power of the radius. So if you shrink the tube down, much less flow, much less flow, lack of oxygen, you get hypoxemia, and now you get pain acutely from that. It's a pretty common association. Almost everybody with MS has some other of the autoimmune diseases. I mean, I've got uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, okay? So that's inflammation of the thyroid problem, probably for all the other reasons we talked about and starting up that way, but they don't always go away. Inflammation is the critical piece Everybody agrees, even all the neurologists agree, that in excess inflammation in the brain, a particular part of the brain, is a component of MS. All right? So the inflammation piece is common across the board. And so by reducing the inflammation com triggering components in your diet, you're going to help both your Raynaud's and your MS. And every time you improve the blood flow in the hands and feet, it's happening also improve blood flow in the brain and heart. Cardiovascular disease is a common association. Even folks with MS tend to have more cardiovascular disease than average. Makes sense because remember MS, microvascular syndrome. It's those small vessels, five to 100 microns, which are the problem. And those are the ones we need to change things. So one of the things I think we need to talk about in future is fibrin deposition because that's another thing that narrow, narrows those blood vessels. And as our, our good friend Joan Beale talks about, the health of the endothelium. 
even a single micron, so that's a pretty small number, of fibrin on the layer of the endothelium or lining of the blood vessel in the brain or in the heart reduces the flow of oxygen by a factor of five times. It takes longer for the oxygen to get across. So all these are tied together. The flow matters because it gets the oxygen there. The oxygen matters so you can bump it up. But all of those work in combination to get good supply to things. And this comes back really well to COVID-19. It's not a bad place to wrap up because with COVID-19, we get inflammation, we get airways narrowing because inflammation means swelling. As the airway swells a little bit, it gets a smaller opening. Flow with the air going through is reduced. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting less air in and it's only got 20% oxygen in it. Typically, you're getting less oxygen in. Now you're getting hypoxic and now you're adding to the whole inflammation cascade. And that's when you may get the cytokine storm where, you know, you're going to need intensive care potentially. Mm -hmm. And the, to prevent that oxygen. So remember, get your pulse oximeter. If you can get access, access to oxygen, and that'll vary where you are in the world. In a perfect world, you could get a plug-in oxygen concentrator in this time of scarcity, which is where we're in and all over the world now. You may need to rent some oxygen tanks, okay, and get those. And this is easy and should be first considered by anybody that's got borderline oxygenation. Maybe they were assessed with their pulse oximeter and a blood gas at hospital and they said, yeah, you don't need it. You don't qualify. Okay, that doesn't mean you're out of the woods completely. It just means you don't fit their criteria. So right now, I would re-knock on those doors and ask them, well, COVID-19 is coming. Can I at least get an option to get some oxygen tanks so I can stay at home and hopefully battle out my COVID-19 on my own? Because being in hospital has got a whole new set of risks. And if we get those hospitals inundated with no end of people, then the people in the hospital have a very tough time. They're going to have to make decisions. Who can we look after? So an old guy, 66, multiple illnesses, including MS. Well, you're going to take a room at the back of the bus. Okay, fine. I just didn't do it at home if I can. And I've helped some people already stay at home with those parameters because that's the ultimate option if we can look after ourselves. Only a small number will need to get to the end stage route. Let's me make it so that the hospitals can help those people the most. Right. Um, we just have a couple more questions. I'll try to knock them off really quickly. Um, hi, Steve and Pam. From Dan Sipple, do you guys always see low acromancy and low diversity in general in the microbiomes of your MS patients? I'd have to go back through our patient files, but the low acromancy hasn't seemed to be a pattern from what I've seen, but definitely low diversity. Um, we answered the Raynaud's one. Uh, what about clients who are also anemic? Again, I would yeah. look for those upstream issues. So why, what is contributing to the, Im the imbalances in the body, that's why the person is anemic. So low stomach acid could be one of them. Uh, dysbiosis of the microbiome could be another. So you end up having poor absorption, inflammation, reducing absorption. I'd be really, I'm usually pretty cautious about recommending iron supplements because as Bill mentioned, iron uh, can be toxic. Um, so definitely look for the root causes before you try supplementing. And then is a smartphone pulse oximeter okay? Uh, well, I, I don't think a pulse, ox it'll give you your pulse, but I don't know of a one that gives you your oxygen saturation. Okay. They're not the same thing. Um, I'm pretty sure that there isn't one that was able to do that calculation, but if you do, please, you know, forward it to me on the part of the Facebook or whatever, I'll look it up and I'll talk about it next time if I can find such a thing within the smartphone group. And just before we leave anemia, the piece you must sort out, is it due to blood loss? So a, a common one that I have seen is the women premenopausal. They're bleeding a huge amount with their menstrual periods and now they're anemic. And part of the trigger sometimes is hypothyroidism. 
So that gets in the mix. And the other in men and women, somebody may have missed or not thought about because you didn't have the family history or whatever is a bowel cancer or a bowel, large bowel polyp, which is bleeding. You're not going to have any luck getting that sorted out these days because everybody's very busy with everything else and all elective investigation is put on the back burner. But keep it uppermost in your mind and sort it out. Two weeks or four weeks or six weeks in those scenarios isn't going to make an awful lot of difference. But six months in a year, well, it'll be a big deal. So you may get something very treatable. Anemia is almost always a clue. So you need to follow up on it and people need to do it when they have time and energy. Well, I think that brings us to a close today. I think next week on Tuesday, next, we're going to focus a bit more, particularly on the oral microbiome. Uh, we'll talk again about pulse oximeters if people are interested and uh, we'll take it up from there and we'll give you an update on what other new pieces have happened. So we've talked about a few new ones today. And we'll see if we have more information as it comes out. And once again, stay well. The longer you can stay well now, the more we're learning about how to combat this virus with the resources we have or don't have, and our better chances are. Mm -hmm. And again, if you can share this video with your circles, we've shared it around our, our circles as much as we possibly can. So um, the more you share it uh, with your uh, with your reach, the better for us. Uh, and for those that aren't on Facebook, please have them go to drbillcode.com, D-R-B-I-L-L-C-O-D-E, because we're having them posted on there on YouTube. And that is another resource because I know part of the world isn't on Facebook. Fair enough. They're not going to change. That's okay. But at least they're a captive audience. They've usually got the wherewithal to check this out. Thanks again. All right. Bye, everyone. We'll see you next week.